On June the 5th, 1999, the Great Western Locomotive 6024, King Edward I, wore the Bristolian headboard to work a rail tour from London to Bristol and then back as far as Didcos. There was a 500 tonne load and a tight schedule in order to keep out of the way of the high speed trains, so it would be a tough test for a 70 year old steam locomotive. A battery of TV cameras was positioned to follow its progress, not just at the line side, but also on the footplate to document a bygone age in detail never attempted before. The King's journey was also followed from the air, and an effort was made to capture not just the sight of steam, but also its sound. The cast of this movie are members of the 6024 Preservation Group and six professional EWS engine men, plus members of the travelling public from Colchester who booked a day out at Bath and Bristol with steamy affairs. It was Derby Day. The weathermen had promised everything from blue skies to violent thunderstorms. Before the day was out, the king would have been through the lot. It's often said that a steam tour is not so much a journey as an adventure, and this was one adventure that would long be remembered by those who rode with the king. The story begins at dawn the day before as the King simmers alongside Henderson Hall at Didcot engine shed. The locomotive is brought gently to working temperature to minimise wear and tear. It gives the 6024 support crew a chance to lubricate over 200 service points, some with lids but about half of them are pots designed for a cork stopper. With all the actual lubrication points, and it depends what you call a lubrication point, but there are about 250 points to do, but I mean that includes grease nipples and greasing um, certain non-rotating parts and things like that, but cork-wise there are about um, 100 corks to remove and to oil up. Other volunteers clean the engine before each trip. Oxford postman Bob Robson has been cleaning the King for 10 years. The paintwork is like a mirror. He considers it an absolute privilege to be part of the team. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? You know, what more could you ask? I never dreamt I'd work on a, lo on a King locomotive or even be on a support crew, go on a footplate. It's just a dream, dream come true. I always wanted to work in a locomotive shed. I prefer this, this part of the job actually to the run itself. The problem about the run itself, like this Valentine's Day outing over the Burks and Hants, is that a week's polishing is ruined in a couple of hours. Well, when the engine comes back off a run, I generally come over one afternoon a week, so I work on the, the post I was in Oxford, and I finish by midday, and I'll perhaps have two or three hours over, over here with two or three other cleaners who have joined up with me. We basically start straight away cleaning again. I just find cleaning the locomotive very, very therapeutic because she's a very beautiful piece of um, living railway heritage in my opinion. Underneath is evidence of just how closely the motion is packed together. Minus tender, the engine weighs in at just under 90 tonnes, with the heaviest axle loading of any steam engine, 22 and a half tonnes, sitting on the driving wheels. We will slowly walk, work our way along the engine. The black section you can see is the smoke box. This is where all the hot gases are drawn through boiler tubes into here and ejected out through the chimney on the top. Walking further back, the main steam points that bring steam down through into the cylinders, which is the heart of the engine. 
Where we come onto the green section is the actual boiler part which is full of water carrying between 1500 and 2000 gallon of water in the boiler all the way back to the beginning of the cab in this section here, this square section inside of that water jacket is the firebox the firebox fed by the fireman from inside on the footplate and you'll see show later is 11 foot 6 long from its front doors so the fireman has to shovel coal or throw coal 11 foot 6 which is a fair distance to throw coal when you think a fireman on a long turn might be firing 7 tonne of coal on a shift all a question of technique the capacity of the firebox is usually about one and a half tonne of coal in the firebox at any one time, depending on how hard the engine is working, on how deep a fire he needs in there. He'd normally be shoveling about eight to twelve shovelfuls every two to three minutes through a working day. In recent years, the King has done some of her hardest work. This is the long drag from Settle to Carlisle, at the very limit of sustainable boiler output. There'll be no such hill climbing this weekend on Brunel's billiard table of a track between London and Bristol, though the long one in a hundred through Box Tunnel usually proves interesting. As the engine emerges into the morning mist, it's time for one of the heroes of the support crew to spring into action. Colin Washbourne is the acknowledged expert at reaching those parts of the engine the others can't. At an age when a lesser man might be content with retirement, Colin prepares for a spot of mountaineering inside the frames. The outward simplicity and elegance of Western locomotives was bought at a price, as Colin knows only too well for ease of maintenance was not a priority in the drawing offices at Swindon. Like all things at uh, design on a drawing board, they didn't think much about accessibility at times. And you can see the, the struggle it is. I'm small, it's advantageous to get at some part, but in this case, I want to be short with a bloody great long arm down to my ankles. So they do say that some of the Swindon people born in Swindon were totally deformed. <laughs> so long, one long uh, arm longer than the other. Midday and the engine has been turned on Didcot's turntable ready for coaling and ready for the fitness to run examination that will take most of the afternoon. The King is going nowhere until an exhaustive safety check has been completed. As she waits in the June sunshine you can see the quality of restoration in every detail of the engine. There's also time to find out a bit about how the locomotive is driven and that relationship between regulator and cutoff which has been the subject of so much discussion and debate over the years. This is your regulator. This is basically to start the locomotive away. Um, to start the engine away you you pull the, the regulator up towards you and away across the this this bridge here. You've got first and second valve on a regulator. First valve would be up to about here on the on the quadrant. Second valve is when it goes all the way over fully open. The speedo for the loco 
all the large 460s on the Great Western was fitted with, were fitted with speedos. In fact, most other regions or other railways at the time, until the 50s, didn't actually fit speedos to the logos. The drivers basically had to guess the speed they were travelling. Just below the speedo you've got the reverser. This is basically forward and reverse for the locomotive. And at the scale, which I don't know whether you can see, just on top of the reverser here, it's from 0 to 75 in reverse, 0 to 75 forward gear. That's what they call the cutoff. Green Arrow was a visitor among the Great Western engines as the King moved off under her own steam. 6024 is about to give the cameraman a demonstration of why locomotives need drain cocks. Coal quality has been the Achilles heel of the King in recent years. It was designed around abundant supplies of Welsh coal, but nowadays has to make do with supplies from as far afield as Poland, or in this case, Colombia. Hey. The fitness to run exam is an instant MOT which expires tomorrow evening. Steve Underhill's inspection includes the smoke box for signs of steam leaks. Okay, so now we'll move on to the mechanical part of the exam. Which you check in for any new, any loose nuts, bolts, fittings, and obviously for any broken springs. Anything you might find as you go around that's loose that shouldn't be loose. We don't want anything falling off at all. So you check for any broken leave, leave, loose springs and whether or not the, uh, the cool springs are okay. Any loose nuts and bolts on the wood? The idea for tapping these nuts is that any, if they're tight, they, you get a nice ring to them. If they're loose, you get like a dull thud. The same as the old wheel tappers, basically. If the tyre was good and tight on the wheel, then obviously you got a nice ring to it. But if you got a loose tyre on the logo, then tapping it, you get a nice dull thud. Just check for any loose motion nuts. Any slide bars. Just basically anything that may may or may not work loose on the on the run. Cylinder relief valve these. It allows any excess pressure in the cylinders to be released when the logo is working. Gets rid of back pressure in the system. It'll be late in the day before the King is handed over to the EWS crew rostered to take the engine and support coach a short journey along the Great Western Main Line to an overnight stabling point. King Edward I is going home. Old Oak Common, four miles outside Paddington, was once the Great Western's biggest shed. More than a hundred steam locomotives lived here, including, for a while, engine number 6024, which still wears Old Oak's famous 81A shed plate. The usual banter is missing as the headboard's fitted. 
There aren't words to express the pride and the poignancy of this scene. It was a very long road back from the dead. The army of volunteers that saved engines like the King from Die Woodham scrapyard at Barry ask no reward beyond seeing them back at work. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, of course, but many people believe GWR locomotives were the most beautiful of them all. To an outsider, a Great Western locomotive, Castle King, or, you know, most of the big 460s of the Great Western build, they, they look how you would expect a steam locomotive to look. And with the, the green, the Brunswick green, the copper cap chimneys, the brass safety valve bonnets, and all the brass beading, number plates, name plates, they're very, very pleasing to the eye. The Southern Railway in, nine, in, the nine, in 1926 had built the Lord Nelsons, which uh, took the acclaim of being the most powerful 460 in the country, which took it away from the Great Western, uh, whose castles had been the, the most powerful 460s up till then. Um, so there was a decision taken at top level for the Great Western to outdo the Southern again. Well, the King is basically just an enlarged castle, which was an enlarged star. It's a larger, larger firebox, larger boiler, and the other thing was that they reduced the size of the driving wheel slightly from six foot eight to six foot six. Old Oak Common is a very different place from that remembered by generations of schoolboys who sneaked in along the Grand Union Canal towpath. The Class 66 diesel looks very alien here. But then, of course, it is alien, having arrived at Newport Docks from the other side of the Atlantic only a couple of weeks earlier. Tending the first king to America for a grand tour is one thing, but what Swindon would have made of this site is quite another. A hundred years ago, the only locomotive imports were for test purposes, just to make sure ours were the best. The real victims of this new invasion are the locomotives that replaced steam in Britain and a representative trio that have seen better days await their fate as 6024 moves forward for turning. The man at the controls is the popular traction inspector Dennis Donovan, who's driven most of the mainline survivors in recent years and who'll be in charge of the trip to Bristol. But what sort of ride will it be on the locomotive at 75 miles an hour, which is the maximum permitted for steam these days? If the track is good, the King rides very well, very smoothly. It's, they, were, they were always well known for, uh, for the riding qualities. And 6024 is very good. Obviously, if you've got bad track, then she'll pick it up very quickly. Once there were four turntables at Old Oak Common, all under one massive roof. Thankfully this one, and a few others around the country, survived. It's not uncommon for mainline steam engines to travel an hour in reverse to reach a triangle where they can be turned. And though there'll be some toing and froing on the tight curves at St Philip's Marsh in Bristol today, the trip is a comparatively easy one. The 13-coach train from Colchester will be brought as far as Willesden Junction by the Class 47 diesel, and that's just up the road from Old Oak, although what sounds like a simple change from diesel to steam will prove to be problematic. Although, in the breakfast time sunshine of a June morning, nothing can spoil the vision of the ultimate 460 express locomotive preparing to move off.
The support crew have done their bit. The king's in sparkling condition with a good clean fire and boiler pressure nudging 220 pounds. It's time for the locomotive to be handed over to the men who drive her on the main line. EWS drivers Chris Greystone and Dave Davis are rostered onto the king. Chris is the one doing the groaning, but then he's acting as fireman today, and the king does like to eat well. Not every 59-year-old would volunteer for the task of shifting three or four tons of coal on a Saturday morning, and it was supposed to be his rest day. With steam, the trick is timing the production of power. It's just like the old days. The only difference now is the panting of the air pump, a necessary evil in the modern era. Visitors to the footplate often remark on how laid back professional engine men appear to be. It's the same impression that air travellers have when they visit the flight deck of their holiday jets. It's all so relaxed as the king moves off. And that's because they've been doing this job since they were kids. But there is an underlying watchfulness which you can see in the traction inspector's eyes. For theirs is one of the most responsible of jobs and they never forget it. Chris Greystone has been working steadily with the shovel since they left Old Oak Common. There's a knack to firing, an economy of effort that comes only with practice. That's their train in the background, by the way. Today, the Bristolium will be predominantly green, which is not quite how the Great Western Railway liked it. There's also a bit of blood and custard in the rake, plus the nice chocolate and cream support coach. But never mind, this is steam paying its way in the modern world bums on seats with an enjoyable view of the engine over breakfast. Dave Davis with characteristic roll-up and a railwayman's patience wants to get moving but there's a hitch involving marshalling and signallers. There's nothing the train crew can do until Dennis has made contact with rail track and the diesel has been allowed to move forward from the train. Only then can 6024's driver get on with the job in hand. The 10 minutes plus that they've lost at Willesden isn't their fault, but they will be expected to make up time if they can. The men on the footplate have every intention of doing just that. Chris has got the fire just as he wants it. The needle's on the red line, and ahead of them lies one of the world's great railway journeys. Isambard Kingdom Brunel walked in these hills in search of a railway route and decided that Mother Nature knew best. He would follow the Thames and set the railway peacefully into the countryside. Even to this day, the most gaudy of liveries are adopted by the landscape. Onto this track came a king out of exile. Most of its million and a half miles were along this very line. Old and new were to meet throughout the day, as they did here at West Drayton.
A decision had been taken to use a filming helicopter, but only as far as Didcot on the down journey. The line's never far from traffic noise at the London end. But out of respect for other line siders, places like the Vale of the White Horse would be filmed only in the evening. From the sky, the Royal Progress could be seen in all its glory. Well, this engine running the Bristolian was sort of exactly what she was built for. Uh, to run high-speed, heavy trains. Uh, the heaviest trains run in Britain, really, uh, to get to your destination uh, fast. Not the fastest train going, but with the heaviest weights to keep the crack expresses. They were the pride of the Great Western Railway. The King was already making up time. The relief of the man in charge, whose day had begun rather nervously. Pure panic, really, at the start. Um, the, uh, the adrenaline starts to run uh, because the, uh, the time ticks away so fast and you think you've got two or three hours before the run, as it's the first thing this morning at half past five, uh, the, uh, the run seemed a long way away, but uh, all of a sudden it was there, we were five minutes before departure, and uh, getting all the support crew together, making sure we didn't leave anyone behind, liaising with the traction inspector for the day, um, and then making sure everyone's on board. Um, relaxing slightly after that, when, as you can hear, the engine working very well now, fingers crossed everything seems to be in place. We've just uh, gone through a station, we've just um, drawn back about five minutes of our late departure, uh, so we're probably in for an on-time arrival at Digcut all being well. There was one member of the support crew who didn't see Sonning cutting any more than she'd glimpsed the River Thames at Maidenhead. She was slaving over crew lunches in a kitchen that was far from ideal. Pretty terrible really, there's not very much space, there's nowhere to put anything and it's not exactly the most hygienic place in the world but we try to do our best with, with what we've got and uh, we're making improvements all the time, we just acquired a fridge so that's a, that's a real step forward. While Sarah was making kebabs in the support coach behind the engine, the King was marching north towards Goring Gap. Ahead of it, like a royal herald, went the 47 and the wiser watchers at the line side knew that where it went, 6024 wouldn't be far away. Gradually, it became clear that this was a sparkling run. Dave Davis had lifted the 500-tonne train smartly away from Reading and notched her up to a very comfortable 75 miles an hour. Approaching Cholsey, she was being eased slightly to keep within the permitted maximum, and that 10-minute deficit was rapidly disappearing. Long gone are the goring troughs, so there'd have to be a water stop at Didcot. 
but the train was still running at over 60 miles an hour when one of the HSTs caught it up. The shots from the air, and then from the bridge near South Morton, demonstrate the difference in performance between the King and its successor. But that's not to say that this hadn't been a memorable run so far, and the King was being carefully timed. Well, I think uh, one of the outstanding features of today's run has been the way the engine has been so quick off the mark. Um, the run from Reading to Didcot, which, in my opinion, as a former retired railway timetabler, was very tight indeed. In fact, the, the, the engine bettered that by a minute and a half with a train of over 500, 500 tonnes. 13 carriages, all of them um, heavy, heavyweights with the Commonwealth bogies, usually and we actually attained 75 miles an hour within about 11 miles of the start from Reading and that is absolutely sensational with a train of that weight. Others on the train were doing calculations of their own trying to pick a derby winner and as the Bristolian slowed down an amateur cameraman on an HST was idly filming the view This is the king as seen by the passerby, and this is the train he was filming from. The water stop was Colin's chance to get out with the oil can again in search of any one of 250 possible problems, but there were none, except for a shortage of water. The tanker driver's pump had failed, and with less than a thousand gallons in the tender, the support crew were quickly off in search of a hydrant, and there just happens to be one near the overbridge. These men of the footplate did their share of watering and coaling years ago, and are quite happy for others to enjoy what used to be considered a chore. There's no hurry on the next section because the King's being looped out of the way of normal traffic on what is still one of Britain's busiest intercity routes. The four tracks go down to two a bit further on towards Uffington, so this is the place to play leapfrog. There's a commentator on board to tell the Steamy Affairs customers what's going on. Uh, one of the problems of fitting in a steam train like this amongst all the regular trains on a weekday is that you have to get out of the way of some of the high-speed trains from time to time. And that just happened. The train went whizzing by, as you may have noticed just now. And we've been able to get off the main line and uh, with all the up, we're getting back on the main line in a moment and resume our merry journey. But that is one of the things that has to be thought about all the time in getting the schedule so that you can fit in a comparatively slow train like this amongst the high speed ones. So that is precisely what we've just been witnessing. If you thought you recognised the commentator's name, you're right. Alan Pegler is the man who saved Flying Scotsman. Uh, this locomotive is, is very interesting to me because it's a king class locomotive which in the old days couldn't run on anything other than certain parts of the Great Western Railway. But this one has been 
privately preserved and modified, and they made modification reducing the height because it was too high to go through tunnels and under bridges on lines like the London Edinburgh line. But now it can run virtually anywhere on the old British Rail network. And so I've had trips behind this engine over routes that I thought I would never go on behind the King. So I've got a very soft spot for it indeed, apart from the fact that it's an extremely good engine, goes like nobody's business. Been running like the clappers this morning, absolutely brilliant. The lovely blue sky at Old Oak Common has been replaced by leaden grey clouds over the White Horse Hill and sure enough, bang on cue, here comes the rain. It wouldn't be England, would it, without summer showers, but while everyone else is looking for a silver lining to the clouds, <coughs> Steve Underhill is using his ears. For more than 20 years, this anchorman in the 6024 Preservation Society has been looking after the king. He knows every sound, every sign. He knows, for instance, that the fire will be getting dirty now, with the beginnings of a purple tinge instead of the healthy orange glow as the clinker builds up. And he knows exactly where they are. Shrivenham. Photographers will already be gathering on the A4 road bridge to see her emerge from Box Tunnel. Bath Spa will soon echo to its old sound as the King strides in from a signal check.
Some of the passengers have opted for an afternoon shopping in Bath. Others will go on to Bristol itself. Most will want to see the King off. The appeal of steam is much broader than the mickey takers would have you believe. They joke about anoraks or train spotters. But anyone who's been on a steam tour will realise that ordinary folk really do run out of their houses to wave at steam trains. It's a phenomenon that no one really understands, but people on the train find themselves waving back to the army of well-wishers. People automatically wave at steam engines. Uh, I've never seen anyone wave at a diesel yet. And uh, we'll go through a station in the middle of the night with people not expecting to see us and they're absolutely amazed as we sweep past and cloud of steam and smoke and they all instinctively wave. Uh, of course we wave back, it's uh, a lovely feeling and uh, gives a nice sort of warm feeling inside that people who don't normally see these uh, sites of preserved locomotives on the main line uh, suddenly get a fill up themselves. There's still an awful lot of nostalgia for steam engines by everybody. I mean it is very, very rare that you do not see somebody all run out the back of the house to the windows and they hear the whistle. And it just gives a tremendous thrill. Somebody described it to me once as sex on rails, but I don't think I'd go that far. <laughs> but um, this engine certainly, in my, in my opinion, as, a, as an ex-Great Western man, I was brought, in, brought up in Torquay, and of course my local shed was Newton Abbott, and you could see on a summer Saturday anything up to 10 Kings going up and down on, on the big Cornish expresses. And to me, they're the, the greatest locomotive ever built. No doubt about that at all. <laughs> Another one of the brand new 66s is about to be looped to let the King pass on the last downhill stretch into Bristol. Few people would claim that the modern railway has much of the charisma that was originally built into it by men like Brunel and Churchwood. But these trains will have to fight it out for the future of rail travel. For a few moments though, Temple Meads belongs to the past as the King arrives and that famous curving canopy echoes to the bark of a great western exhaust. This is as far as 6024 goes, though it's easy to imagine that the King would really like to keep going, to have another run at the Devon Banks and to visit her old home at Lera. The train passes the trio of railwaymen who will take charge of the return trip to Didcot. The King has arrived on time and without fuss. 70 years on, the integrity of her design needs no further comment. Two o'clock in the afternoon and the race is on to prepare the King for the return run. She's due to leave Temple Meads just before six. The engine and support coach have been detached from the empty coaching stop at St Philip's Marsh so that 6024 can be serviced. There are various consumables to replace before the return trip, including the obvious commodities of water and coal. Four members of the support crew spend an energetic afternoon high up on the tender. The third thing that needs replenishing is the fire itself. This is a job for Steve Underhill. The remaining fire has been moved to one side of the firebox while the grate is clear. No drop grate or rocking bars on this engine, so the big blocks of clinker have to be dropped carefully over the side of the locomotive. And that leaves Colin to do the worst job of all, 
you back inside the frames which are now drenched in oil and it's hot in there as well. One empty or forgotten pot can bring a steam locomotive grinding to a standstill so he needs to be able to work methodically in spite of the hostile environment. Behind every successful mainline steam engine is a good support coach, part canteen, part dormitory, part workshop. There's a comprehensive toolkit, but in the days of steam, the toolkit had to fit in the driver's pocket. Part of his tools, as well as his sandwiches, etc., for the guy, uh, you've got to realise the driver was in total control of the loco. He was in total the fireman, everything, and it was his job to make sure the loco was fit for the day as regards water, coal, the oiling up he did as well. Sometimes his father may have helped him but it was his responsibility to do the oiling up. Uh, he would have had a set of tools like these in his kit. They're all different shapes, with little hooks on them, little scrapers and things and they're all there for a purpose, a small corkscrew. Uh, that is broken corks. In a, in, a, in a pot somewhere uh, or something could have gone in a bit deep, the top's broken off the cork, corks go in, pull it out. Other ones, like these, are little looks to pull the trimmings out. Colin's heroics underneath the engine have not gone unnoticed by the footplate crew. And neither is the title of one of the films showing at the nearby Showcase Cinema, as the engine and its long train are dragged backwards towards Temple Meads. It's tight for the big engine on the sharp curves, and she protests for a moment. The Class 47 diesel is doing the work at the other end of the empty train. It'll unhook at Temple Meads and proceed them to Didcot, taking over there when the King comes off. Their next task is to repel boarders as politely as they can at the station platform, but the enthusiasm of the crowds is overwhelming. The railwaymen are all enthusiasts themselves. They're patient in trying to answer the thousand and one questions from members of the public. And everyone, it seems, wants a picture. This was the gallery of photographers that appeared from nowhere on a golf course near Blackburn when the King was due. In fact, one of the golfers asked, are you expecting royalty? They were. Back at Bristol, Steve Underhill is still trying to drink the nice cup of tea he's been promising himself for years, but there's never time for much more than a slurp. And Traction Inspector Brian Dudley Ward is still trying to answer those endless questions. He's one of the most capable engine men in Britain, and will be supervising Paul Burns, who's driving the King for the first time. What sort of worries do they have about a trip like this? Well, the only bit... There's nothing to really worry about is going through a box tunnel. I mean, it's nearly three miles in a tunnel on a gradient. So, uh, you know, that's probably the only part of the journey that may could cause you a problem, but it's very unlikely. I mean, we've been through there before with this several times, so it's a case of... Um, Paul, it's the, the actual fact, the driver today is going to be his first time he's driven this on the main line, so... He's good, he's all right. He's OK. But uh, no, it's, it's a good sort of learning curve for him because we're only going to go as far as Didcot, so uh, um, he should do all right. He's good anyway, he, he knows his job. But it'll be the first time he's had a go at this. And it's not 
an engine you can just get on and drive um, out of course you know it's, it's something you've got to work at this thing it's a beast Jeff Ewings will be feeding the beast more or less continuously for the next hour or so The engine comes into view long before it can be heard and won't disturb nature's evening chorus for another minute or so. It's being worked hard. Apart from the stop at Bath, they'll be mobile on the main line all the way to Wantage and by then an HST will be hard on their heels. And this is the driver's eye view of the road ahead. It's noticeable on the footplate that the sizzle of the safety valves almost drowns out the bark of the exhaust as the engine heads for the short tunnel at St Anne's. Support crew member Richard Abbey with the Red Neckerchief will be our guide to life on the footplate. The, train, the train's well on the way. Paul Burns, the driver, has made, a, made an excellent start. No trace of a slip. He's accelerating nicely up out of Bristol, out of the valley. On the way to... And on the way to a first stop at Bath. Pressure's up near the red mark. Waters, three quarters of a gauge. And everything so far well under control. 6024 King Edward I was built at Swindon in June 1930. She was one of 30 engines built. Primarily for both the West of England run to Plymouth and also on the Midland line to Birmingham and they were designed to haul the heaviest and fastest expresses. King Edward I was based initially down in the West Country at Lara which is near Plymouth and Newton Abbott and she would have regularly worked this route up to London via Bristol and Bath 
and also on what's known as the Barbers and Hans route, the shorter route to London. And she did that from 1930 when she was built, right through the war, up until 1961 when she was withdrawn, ready to be scrapped. Luckily, she went down to the famous scrapyard in South Wales and wasn't broken up. And the society bought her in 1972, one of only three King Class locomotives left. And the only one that's been running on the main line for the last 10 years or so. Now speed's dropping off to go across the viaducts into Bath Spa Station. And here we are just entering. Because we've got 13 coaches on today, we'll have to pull right the way up to the far end of the platform, the London end, in order to make sure all the coaches are in the platform. Farman, Farman inspector just uh, relaying instructions to the driver, who's driving from the right hand side and left hand running. You can't see very much of what's going on on the passenger side. Richard's commentary is interrupted as he helps to pull the coal forward, which will be much appreciated by the fireman. One of the things that makes the King a very physical engine to work is that coal has to be fired from the floor. Other engines are easier to fire, as can be illustrated by the Merchant Navy class engine, Clan Mine. Three five zero two eight is working flat out with a five hundred ton train, and the hither green engineman Don Clark is a busy man. He makes the job look easy anyway, but what's helping Don is the lip on the tender. The coal is being presented handily above ground level. No such creature comforts on the big Western engines, and Jeff Ewings already looks like he's done a good day's work. Part of the reason the crew are smiling is that they know the restart from Bath will be a slippery one. The light drizzle will combine with any diesel residue into a nice slippery coating. In fact, it had just started to rain lightly when the King tiptoed through Didcot station on the way down, with predictable results as the crew tried to power away. did pot in the morning. Will they be able to stop it slipping at Bath in the evening? The driver's just cracked the regulator. Just to get the loco underway. It's a bit wet and slippy now because it's been raining. First, it looks as though they've got away with it, and the fireman relaxes for a moment. Whoa. 
Paul Burns has now got the classic engineman's dilemma. He needs to accelerate the train away on the long climb to Box Tunnel, but can't use the full 250 pounds of steam pressure that's available. She simply won't keep her feet. It's the equivalent of driving the family car uphill on ice, which is why he wants to get the locomotive into a higher gear for the best possible traction, and works the cutoff as well as the regulator. From now on, mercifully, the King's normally sure-footed nature takes over and the driver can get his shoulder behind the regulator. They need to be up in second valve as they leave the city's famous gardens behind them. Brian Dudley Ward watches quietly, taking it all in. Part of his attention is now focused on the pressure gauge They'll need to use the injectors to replenish the water level in the boiler and that will rob them of further steam pressure. They're going well enough, but boiler pressure is still falling as they approach Brunel's famous tunnel. It's difficult to convey life on the footplate inside a tunnel when a big engine is working really hard. A torch flicks between pressure and water gauges as the traction inspector maintains his vigil. The pressure gauge is reading 200 pounds. You probably saw that the firehole door was kept closed as much as possible that because up through Box Tunnel it's on a continuous gradient. The engine's working hard and what they didn't want to do was to draw too much cold air into the fire which cools it and reduces the amount of steam that can be raised. That's Chippenham Station right on time. Now we're climbing all the way to the edge of the Avon Valley and up onto the edge of the Cotswolds. The engine's working very, very hard, using a lot of steam. The driver's got her in second valve. And just working the reverser like the gears on a car. back of the firebox, where it's hottest, will start to shake its way down to the front, giving off all the heat on the way. We're climbing steadily now, you see the pressure's just falling back slightly, still very good. So she's been driven fairly hard, but we've got to... But we've got quite a tight time schedule to keep. We've got 13 coaches, 520 odd tons, and we've probably got a high speed train right behind us. As you'll tell from the almost continuous firing, we're still climbing up onto the southern edge of the Cotswolds, 
at Wolf Massif. That's the summit of the climb up from Bristol. After that, it's pretty well all downhill, all the way to Ditka. The line was designed like that by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So it was a gradual climb up from London. And at the summit, he built the engine works at Swindon. And they had different engines to take trains on to Bristol. And although physically Swindon isn't the halfway point between London and Bristol, in real revolutions, the engines that Brunel used exactly halfway. As they approach Wooden Bassett, the line from South Wales can be seen converging on this side of the train. Most of the hard work is now behind them, and the King's making good time, heading for what's left of the mighty railway town where she was built. The bell that you can hear is part of the automatic warning system that we fitted to the King to enable us to travel safely at higher speed. And the bell is an indication that the signal we've just passed is green. It's safe to do so. When we're either catching another train up or being slowed up for a loop, we'll get a siren. The driver has to cancel that to prevent the brakes coming on automatically. Right, we're just, just coming up to Swindon, which is, was the main workshop of the Great Western Railway. 6024 King Edward I was built in June 1930. And the remains of the workshops all right, to the left-hand side of the cab. First of all, we pass the weigh shop, where all the engines were weighed. It is now a brewery. The derelict site you can see is a massive A shop, where the Kings and other famous Great Western engines were built. One time, it's the largest factory in the, in the world. Now we come up to pass the original factory, Built to the turn of the century. The Victorian factory building now part of the new Great Western Museum. There's something undeniably sad about the shell of Swindon Works in an age when we go shopping abroad for new engines. And the King seems happy to leave the storm clouds behind as she continues to shuffle the steam over her shoulder, heading back into unspoiled countryside.
As the helicopter closes in, there are telltale signs of what's happening on the footplate. You can just see the firehole door is open and evidence of steaming water being sprayed around on the footplate as Jeff Ewings engages in some good housekeeping. The farmer's using the pet boy basically to keep the dust down. With Didcot only a few miles away, they won't need to test the King's steam-raising abilities again. The cut-off is now right back in the teens, and the King moves easily, offering an unusual view of how the inside motion controls the outside valves via rocking arms. They're approaching the four-road section, and the pathing stop which has been built into the schedule by the unseen rail track planners, who are enthusiasts themselves working behind the scenes to give the steam tours the best run they can under conflicting operational pressures. Paul Burns is slowing the heavy train gently. It's so easy for an outsider to forget that there are hundreds of people on the train and that they don't want their cups of tea spilt. The old technology steam engine comes to a standstill near one of Britain's high-tech factories, Williams, the Formula One racing team and the reason for the stop looms up behind them. Well, we just stopped at Wantage Road, being looped for that high-speed train that's just gone past us at about 125 miles an hour. And although we did our best, we uh, didn't really get out of its way. Well, at least we didn't hold it up. We've now got an amber signal now. We're pulling the way out of the loop. Oh, just a minute down, otherwise the trip all the way from Bristol has gone exceptionally well. And we're setting off on our final leg, the last 10 minutes run into Digcut. We're all being well, we should arrive right time. Now the crew can give the footplate a thorough cleaning. The traction inspector sets to with the pet pipe so that Jeff Ewings will be able to sweep the wooden floorboards clean. All the EWS men are qualified drivers who usually work in the more comfortable surroundings of a diesel cab and they only do steam as volunteers. People like Jeff Ewings, Paul Burns and Brian Dudley Ward are full of admiration for the preservation groups and they try to hand the engine back as clean as possible. They're approaching the halfway points between London and Bristol. been another excellent run and the traction inspector is pleased that they'll be able to finish in style in the evening sunshine, coasting home with about 1,200 gallons of water left and every prospect of an arrival back on time again. They've run the fire down as much as possible to make life easier for the fire droppers. This is another skill that requires fine judgment. Folks, this is the end of the show. Please be generous. Well, not quite the end of the show because the engine and its support coach 
now have to be returned into the safekeeping of the 6024 Preservation Society and the Great Western Society, whose Didcot base is a world-class steam centre. Jeff Ewings and his mates can reflect on a job well done. And the people who worked so hard to restore 6024 from a Barry wreck can tick off another successful rail tour. They've not always enjoyed the best of coal or even the best of luck, but trips like today's speak volumes about the viability of keeping antique steam engines at work and not just mounting them in a museum. She ends up where she started, on the ash pit road beneath the coal tower, joining all the other engines that wait patiently for their next job. Disposal of the engine will take a couple of hours yet. They have to remove the simple elemental life force of fire. A living thing will become inert metalwork again. The professional drivers will head back to Bristol on the cushions, and the poignant little ceremony with the headboard will take place again. But this is a story with a happy ending. Steam engines are still coming back from the dead. King Edward II is being restored at Didcot in original single chimney form. 6023 was the other one of the pair of engines that escaped cutting up only because they were used to weight test Chepstow Bridge. Didcot's astonishing track record of saving engines is being quietly extended, and a machine that was born in the 19th century and then killed in the 20th is back with a vengeance for the 21st. And as today's embers die, they're already planning tomorrow's adventures. Mm -hmm.